Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last week, we saw Aksum divide into two kingdoms, one composed of the Empire's Arabian territories and the other of the Empire's African territories, after a prolonged and bloody civil war. However, as if this division wasn't bad enough, the two Aksumite kingdoms would soon be rocked by a series of crises of unprecedented magnitude, shaking the foundations of Aksumite society to the core. Episode 22, Plague, War, and Unrest. Sometime around the year 540, an anonymous peasant in an unknown part of inland East Africa was going about his routine day. Like the vast majority of the world's population, he worked an incredibly hard job as an agrarian laborer. At sunrise, he woke up and began his routine work of harvesting the teff crops he had planted earlier in the year. The wet season had ended recently, so it was time to reap the benefits of the monsoon rains and harvest his crop. However, while harvesting one bushel of teff, the peasant farmer encountered something that no farmer ever wants to find in his field. Under one bushel of teff, he discovered the bloated corpse of a black rat. These rats are familiar pests to any farmer and are capable of devouring entire harvests of grain if they're left unchecked. A swarm of these creatures could potentially even threaten his entire livelihood, so this was far from an ideal discovery. Fortunately, this one was dead. But you know what they say about rats. You know, for each rat you see, there's a hundred that you don't. The farmer picked up the rat, angrily mumbling under his breath that his lazy field cat wasn't doing its job properly, and contemplated how he might have to get a new one in the future, before chucking the corpse out of the field and continuing along with his work. Without even understanding the magnitude of what he had just done, this humble peasant farmer, whose name will lay forever in obscurity, had changed human history forever. You see, when he had picked up the rat, a flea from the rat had jumped onto his arm and bit into his flesh with its microscopic jaws. The initial bite went unnoticed, but the bite transmitted a form of bacteria into the farmer's blood called Yersinia pestis. Now this bacteria rarely infected humans, and was usually only transmitted to various small mammals, like you know, rats. However, the bacteria in this particular flea had developed a unique mutation which allowed it to infect humans. While this wasn't the first time ever that the disease had made the jump to human beings, this particular mutation of bacteria would have deadly consequences. Once in the farmer's body, the bacteria began reproducing within him. No symptoms are clear yet, however so the farmer continued on with his daily life, unaware of what was happening inside of him. An ox herder who was making his annual trek between major cities across the East African countryside spotted the farmer in his field. Pastoral herdsmen, in addition to tending to their cows, often made a little bit of a living off of trading various goods to the rural people they encountered on the way. In turn, rural people like the farmer in question relied on the herdsmen as their contact to the outside world both in the idealistic and materialistic sense. The farmer and the herdsman engaged in the usual exchange of news and rumors, and later decided to make some trades. The farmer gave the ox herder some extra teff he had lying around, in exchange for some fancy finished goods, like pottery or metal tools. After this long negotiation, the ox herder, now exposed to the bacteria, made his trip into the Oxamite Empire, infecting the various rural villages he stopped in along the way. Eventually, he made it to his destination, a pasture outside a major Oxumite city where, in addition to feeding his oxen, he made some deals at the local market, infecting the other traveling herdsmen and merchants who resided there. And, once these frequent flyers, so to say, became infected, the spread of the disease exploded. Oxumite cities, like all cities in the world at the time, were incredibly unhygienic cesspools. The poor residents of the cities of late antiquity were packed into dense slums, where they would be exposed to all the vile and disgusting byproducts of life in a world where indoor palming was a rarity. Additionally, residents of a city would often bathe together publicly. While bathing today is rightly seen as a healthy activity, this was much less true when the water you use to clean yourself has been previously used by your potentially disease-carrying neighbors. The lakes and ponds used as public baths and oxen soon became cesspools of bacteria. With the merchant classes unknowingly acting as vehicles, the disease spread quickly from city to city, eventually making its way to the port city of Adulis. Adulis, one of the most significant ports in the whole world, regularly saw thousands of merchants from Europe, India, and other parts of Africa bustle in and out of the city's harbor. This local outbreak became a global pandemic. 
As infected merchants boarded the ships to sell their wares internationally, they infected the crew. Then, once this crew landed in their far-flung destination, the sailors would get off the boat and begin unloading the ship's content, infecting the dock workers that they met, who would then infect the crew from the next ship and continue the cycle. In 541, we have the first record of this disease spreading outside of the Oxamite world, first being recorded in the ancient port city of Pelusium. From there, it spread throughout the Roman Empire, then throughout the entire Mediterranean, and eventually into Persia and Northern Europe. The disease that Yersinia pestis causes is called the bubonic plague. Once infected with the plague, people would develop severely swollen lymph nodes, as well as an intense fever and vomiting that proved fatal. This global outbreak is known as the First Plague Pandemic, was called Justinian's Plague in the Roman Empire. It would eventually become the harbinger of the more famous plagues that would decimate the world throughout the medieval era. While this was not the first time in history that bubonic plague had infected humans, it was the first time that the disease developed into a catastrophic global pandemic. As far west as Ireland and as far east as China, the plague soon engulfed the world, with East Africa and the Mediterranean being hit the hardest out of anywhere. As I'm sure we've all, unfortunately, grown aware of, Plagues can cause a lot of economic destruction, in addition to their catastrophic toll on human life. With the plague beginning to engulf Oxum, the government and economy of the empire became paralyzed. Basic infrastructural needs could not be addressed, because the teams of workers sent to repair roads and dams would become infected and grow sick with the plague. And as the plague claimed an ever-increasing number of victims, labor shortages became commonplace, especially on farms, which caused agriculture output to plummet. And, like a series of dominoes, before you know it, the entire Oxamite economy is in shambles. This plague couldn't have come at a worse time. Five years prior to the outbreak of this plague, a series of volcanic eruptions halfway across the world spewed millions of tons of ash into the atmosphere. This ash blotted out the sun globally, causing a prolonged period of cooling known as the Late Antique Little Ice Age. Globally, the temperature dropped by 2 degrees Celsius. Now, at first glance, 2 degrees doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, you wouldn't cancel a beach trip just because of a 2 degree temperature change from the weather forecast. So what's the big idea? Well, the effects on agriculture were tremendously devastating. The water of the Ethiopian highlands comes primarily from the Indian Ocean monsoon winds that arrive annually. Oxamite farmers benefited tremendously from these predictable bouts of rainfall, as it allowed them to precisely plan planting and harvesting dates for maximum efficiency. However, in 536, the monsoon season never came. And the next year, when it did arrive, it was incredibly short. As this monsoon drought intensified, the crops in the highlands began to dry up. It became clear to Amidas, the Oxamite emperor at the time, that if he didn't do something soon, famine would overtake the Oxamite realm. To avoid famine, Amidas ordered a set of drastic emergency economic reforms. Many of Oxum's specialized merchants and craftsmen, who lived primarily in the large urban cities, were forced to return to the rural farmlands. A mass exodus out of the cities and into the countryside began. Fields of pepper and orchards of frankincense were burned to the ground, and in their ashes were built fields of staple crops like teff and barley. These reforms proved successful, and famine was averted for the moment. Despite the short-term success, though, the long-term unsustainability of these emergency policies would eventually start to take their toll. You see, while teff is very efficient in how many calories it produces per harvest, it also does a number on the soil it grows in. If a field is replanted with teff too often, the field soil will quickly have all the nutrients sucked out of it, and it will turn into unusable land. So, Amidas had managed to avoid severe famine for the moment, but was doing so at the expense of the long-term health of his empire's soil. This soil devastation became most severe in the areas surrounding the capital city. Between the severe weather events and the absolutely catastrophic plague, the early 540s really make our crises today look like a relative cakewalk. As Oxum's economy collapsed under the weight of plague and climatic shifts, so too did the Oxumite government. With the government preoccupied with trying to rescue its floundering economy, its influence within its neighbors sharply declined. To the south, the Jewish people of the Semian kingdom weren't doing much better in terms of dealing with the plague and famine. This semi-independent kingdom, which paid taxes to Oxum in the form of tribute, could no longer afford to keep up these payments. So, they ceased altogether. Oxum's puppet kingdom in Nubia, called Lodia, similarly ended their tribute payments, as did the nomadic Beja tribes of the desert to the north. The end of these payments essentially represented these client states declaring their independence from Oxumite puppet rule. 
and with its government preoccupied by trying to avoid famine, Oxnum was in no position to protest. I mean, what are you going to do? Assemble an army, which you'll have to feed and clothe and pay, and just hope that they don't get infected with the plague and turned into a pile of corpses? Seems risky. So, with its economy already doing poorly, and tribute payments now a thing of the past, Oxum went into an absolute economic freefall. However, in Abraha's kingdom of Oxumite Arabia, things were actually somehow even worse. As we discussed in our last episode on Saba, southern Arabia is a fairly arid region, less so than the sandy deserts to its north, but receiving significantly less rainfall than the Ethiopian highlands. The region has zero permanent rivers, and instead relies on ephemeral streams called wadis which flow down from the mountains during the monsoon season. And with the monsoons being especially weak during these times, many of the wadis ran dry. To make matters worse, in order to make use of these temporary streams, the Sabaeans and Himyarites had relied on enormous dams and reservoirs for irrigation. Between the dozens of wars and invasions over the last two centuries, this infrastructure had been badly damaged and was in desperate need of repair. The Aksumite king of Yemen, Abraha, ordered repairs to be made on the crumbling dams and reservoirs in Saba and Himyar. But, as mentioned earlier, large teams of workers tend to be attractive vessels for plague. So, as if being engulfed by plague wasn't bad enough, famine also became an endemic problem in Aksumite Arabia. Between the plague and famine, it must have really seemed like the world was coming to an end. Clearly, from the perspective of the Jewish Himyarite Arabs living under the Oxumite yoke, this was the wrath of God against the Oxumite invaders. Maybe, if they overthrew Abraha and brought back a rightful Jewish Himyarite king, these calamities that were befalling them would end. So, just when things couldn't get any worse, Abraha now has to deal with a military rebellion as well. The son of the dead Himyarite king, Nuas, began raising an army to kick out the invader Abraha. However, it seems that, despite his struggles, Abraha was more than ready to deal with this nascent rebellion. An informant told King Abraha about this budding rebel army, and he quickly mobilized his own army to crush the pretender prince before he was ready for battle. This plan was a massive success, and it couldn't have come at a better time. The plague happened to be waning in its intensity during this era, and with the rebellion defeated, Abraha could turn his attention to restoring the broken economy of his kingdom. He renewed his effort to restore the agricultural infrastructure of southern Arabia. By the year 550, he had successfully repaired the dam at Marib, restoring the long-failing agricultural sector of the city. Before the rebellion, he had been forced to cancel plans to restore the dam at Marib, a crucial piece of hydraulic engineering that watered major tracts of farmland throughout northern Yemen. By the year 550, though, he had successfully tried again to repair the dam restoring the long-failing agricultural sector in the region. The crushing, decades-long famine was, at least partially, finally alleviated. While the famine was ending, though, the overall economy of Himyar was still in ruins. International trade, the region's main source of income, was in shambles. The two Aksumite empires were not the only states in the world whose economies had been wrecked by plague, so the global desire to spend money on fancy Arabian incenses were not exactly there. While the plague had slowed down in Arabia, the economic damage it had caused was still lingering. It was clear that trying to simply rebuild the economy of Himyar into its old system of incense exportation wouldn't solve the problem. Instead, Abraha devised a new strategy to base his economy around, pilgrimage. Much like how the tourists flock to the big cities of today, in late antiquity, pilgrims of certain religions would flock to sites of special religious significance or prestige. In fact, you've probably heard of at least one famous pilgrimage that continues to this day, the annual Muslim Hajj, or pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. While Islam did not quite exist yet, Mecca was still the primary attraction for pilgrims throughout the Arabian Peninsula. Thousands of pilgrims of different religions, including Christians, Jews, Zoroastrians, and pagans, would flock to the all-purpose center of worship in Mecca known as the Kaaba. The Kaaba, that giant black cube you've probably seen in pictures before, was filled on the inside with a collection of paintings, idols, and frescoes of various gods and holy figures. Abraham, Jesus, Zoroaster, al Makkah, Macher, Mani, Zeus, Isis, the Virgin Mary, and dozens of other holy figures were featured in the Kaaba, making it a popular destination for pilgrims of all faiths. Much like how tourism is a lucrative industry today, so too was pilgrimage a lucrative industry. Pilgrims, like tourists, bring money with them, and they spend lavishly on the inns and markets of the city they travel to. So, in a quest to attract that sweet pilgrim money, 
Abraha planned the construction of a great church in his capital of Sana'a that would surpass the Kaaba as the primary destination of Arabian Christian pilgrims. This church, known as al Kules, was the largest ever built in Arabia at the time, and was certainly an attractive site. The church ultimately took almost two decades to build. Its walls were covered in quarried stone of black, yellow, and white coloration. No expense was spared in its decoration, as pricey sculptures and art were imported from as far away as Oxum and even Constantinople. Crosses of solid gold and silver covered the church's walls. However, despite all the splendor and magnificence of the al church, not that many people showed up. Abraha could decorate his church with as much marble, gold, and expensive art as he wanted, but he could never trump the single biggest advantage that the Kaaba had going for it. Familiarity. When it comes to choosing all sorts of things, human beings tend to favor familiar, safer options over new, adventurous ones. Most of us choose brands of food we already recognize from the store, eat at the same restaurants, and believe in the same religious beliefs for most of our lives. And, when it comes to where you choose to go on pilgrimage, the Christian tribes of Arabia overwhelmingly chose the more familiar option. Not to mention, despite having a respectable presence in the region, Christianity was still a minority religion in the predominantly polytheistic Arabian Peninsula. So, congratulations, Abraha. You just spent a huge sum of money to build the less popular pilgrimage option for a minority of Arabs. Good job. This lacking pilgrimage attendance frustrated Abraha. He'd spent all that time, all that money, and all of those resources organizing the al church, and it wasn't even paying off. But he was never a man who was willing to accept defeat without a fight. So, instead of just recognizing that this decision was a mistake and moving on, he devised a new solution. So, Christian Arabs, you want to go to the Kaaba instead of al Good luck doing that, when the Kaaba is a smoldering pile of ashes. Yeah, that was his plan. He was going to march on Mecca and destroy the Kaaba, so that these pilgrims would have nowhere else to go, and they would have to show up to his church instead. Now, this whole situation is pretty ridiculous. This is like if the UK decided that they wanted Buckingham Palace to attract more tourists, so they decided to drop a nuke on Versailles. But, while it may seem silly, this was not a joke. When a group of polytheistic vandals decided to deface al Kalais, he decided to blame the incident on the government of Mecca, somehow, and declared war in the year 568. Despite the economic troubles that were still facing his kingdom, Abraham managed to raise a pretty impressive army. Not only did he raise several well-equipped infantry regiments, he still possessed a wing of war elephants imported from Aksumite Africa. This army began its march on Mecca, intent to erase the Kaaba from the map. When the armies of the Quraysh, the Arab tribe that ruled Mecca at the time, tried to halt the advance of Abraha's army, they were flattened with ease and in brutal fashion. To everyone present, it was clear that Mecca's small garrison wouldn't stand a chance. Now, depending on which source you believe, what happened next could have gone in two different ways. In the Islamic tradition, the story goes that, as Abraha approached Mecca, his elephant, named Mahmud, started acting strangely. For seemingly no reason, Mahmud stopped his advance, knelt to the ground, and refused to move. Now, Abraha needed Mahmud to be with him when he entered Mecca. He had planned on using the elephant's strength to pull down the Kaaba's walls. But, no matter how harshly Abraha reprimanded the pachyderm, he persisted, never budging an inch. And, with his advance slowed, a flock of birds swooped down from the heavens and began dropping rocks on Abraha and his soldiers. Terrified by this avian attack, Abraha's army went into a panic and retreated back to Yemen. Abraha soon after succumbed to the wounds he had suffered during the bird's attack, and died. The Kaaba was safe. While this story is certainly enticing, and honestly just fun, most historians don't really believe that it's true. The less interesting, but frankly more likely story is that Abraha's army was devastated by the remaining waves of plague, or some other disease, or maybe encountered supply issues that would stop them from laying siege to a fortified city like Mecca. But regardless of why he slogged his way back to Sana'a, the fact is that his mission to destroy the Kaaba ended in embarrassing failure. In Arabian history, this year, 568, became an incredibly important date. It became known as the Year of the Elephant, and would even briefly serve as the Year Zero in the Arabian calendar. Just two years later, the humiliated Abraha died and left his ailing kingdom to his son, Mashruk. Between the expensive building projects and a costly military expedition, Aksumite Arabia was in really bad financial shape when Mashruk inherited the kingdom. The state coffers were empty. 
his army was broken. And, with this weakness being clear, it was only a matter of time before somebody decided to rebel against him. Oxamite Africa, on the other hand, enjoyed a more successful recovery. It had never been hit by the severe famines that Arabia suffered through, and, now that the plague was mostly gone, its economy was returning to a state of relative normalcy. Sure, the soil devastation and urban flight would never be reversed, but still, compared to the absolute shambles that Mashruk ruled over, Ambidesa's kingdom was in fairly good shape. Unlike his father, Mashruk did not have the same adamant commitment to independence from Aksum. So, understanding that the survival of his independent kingdom was unlikely, Mashruk decided to formally submit to Ella Amidas. However, while he was submitting to Amidas, he didn't truly intend on giving up all of his power. He sent a group of messengers to Aksum with tribute in tow, and advised them to let Ella Amidas know that he was now his faithful governor of Himyar. Amidas, for his part, was apparently quite happy to let Mashruk remain in power if it meant that tribute payments restarted. After decades of being at odds with itself, the Aksumite Empire was, once again, whole. However, pretty much nobody within Aksumite Arabia saw this as a happy reunion. The Ethiopian elites of the kingdom were royally mad that they were now losing their hard-fought independence. They had been separate from the mother country for about five decades now, and were perfectly happy to stay separate. Not to mention, this decision to begin sending tribute again wasn't a cheap one. Remember, Mashruk inherited an already bankrupt and unstable government, so this decision to restart payments of valuable tribute in exchange for protection was, well, economically questionable. It was the last straw, and, with this final bit of strain on the financial health of Aksumite Arabia, it was also the straw that broke the camel's back. Under this immense financial strain, the government of Aksum's Arabian territories essentially stopped functioning altogether. It couldn't afford to maintain infrastructure or buildings, and Mashruk could only find himself paying enough soldiers to form a small militia, far short of the grand armies and war elephants commanded by his father just a few years ago. Mashruk's half-brother, a man named Mahdi Karib, began plotting to try and overthrow his brother to end this madness, but he was arrested and exiled before he could even begin his coup. Of course, not only did the Ethiopian elite of Aksumite Arabia oppose reintegration into Aksum, so too did the local Arab population. Ever since these Aksumites had shown up, not only had they forced their religion down the Arabs' throats, but their reign had brought nothing but chaos, plague, and famine to southern Arabia. Not only had Abraha and his family engaged in pointless endeavors and failed projects, but they had overtaxed the Arabs to pay for it all. And, with Aksumite Arabia struggling, another rival empire was viewing these territories with increased interest. The Sassanid Empire of Persia had long been a rival of Aksum. The two empires were each other's largest rivals in trade. In order for trade goods to move between East Asia and Europe, they would have to go through one of two trade routes. Merchants could use an overland route, the famous Silk Road, which passed these goods through a series of caravan routes from China or India into Central Asia, then through Persia, and eventually into the Roman Empire. As these merchants passed through Persia, the Persian government could get rich through taxation of foreign merchants, while Persian merchants could resell these precious eastern wares for a profit in the West. Alternatively, though, merchants could instead choose to sell their goods on the maritime trade route. This trade route, which was dominated by the Oxumites, would exchange eastern and western goods across the Indian Ocean. The possession of these competing, lucrative trade routes essentially put Persia and Aksum at odds from the very beginning. However, the relationship between these great empires significantly worsened after the reign of Azana, when Aksum converted to Christianity. By converting to Christianity, Azana had made his intentions clear to cultivate an alliance with the Romans, aka Persia's biggest enemy. When, during the reign of Caleb, Roman ships had assisted Aksum in their invasion of Himyar, it seemed that the Persians' worst fears had been realized, and that Aksum and Rome were now truly close allies. Finally, to make relations even worse, Aksum and Persia, by the time of Ella Amidas, were essentially engaged in an undeclared naval war on the Indian Ocean. Aksumite ships would regularly privateer Persian merchant fleets. At one point, the superior Aksumite navy even blocked Persian merchants from entering the coastal cities of western India, essentially creating an Aksumite monopoly on trade in the region. While this was certainly good for the wallets of Aksumite merchants, it also had the tiny side effect of really angering the Persian government. At this point, the Persians were essentially waiting for any opportunity to strike back at Aksum, an opportunity which would soon make itself clear. In 571, the Persian Shah Khosro I was perched atop his throne in the city of Tesaphon when he received word of an unusual message. 
The message was sent by who else but Mahdi Karib, the exiled half-brother of Mashruk. Karib told the Shah about his opposition to his brother's rule, his desire to return southern Arabia to being an independent kingdom, and that he wanted Persian support in his endeavor. Khosrow had heard rumors of Aksumite weakness in their Arabian territories, but was hesitant to support Mahdi Karib. After all, if he was who he said he was, his earlier coup had failed. How could he be sure that any significant portion of the Aksumite elites in Arabia would support this exiled prince? However, just as he was about to dismiss this request, Khosrow was told that he had another visitor who wanted to see him. This visitor was named Abu Mura Saif ibn Di Yazan al-Himyari, or, to put it in shorter terms, Yazan of Himyar. Yazan was a Himyarite Arab noble, who had seen his family's position and wealth shrink dramatically throughout the Aksumite rule of Himyar. He had also come to Persia, seeking aid in a rebellion against the governor Mashruk, as he planned to overthrow the Ethiopian and place himself on the throne of a new independent Himyarite kingdom. Now, Khosrow had been skeptical when he had received Karib's message, and if he hadn't come just after the message was sent, he'd likely be skeptical of Yazan's claims as well. However, the combined pleas of these two men convinced Khosrow to take a chance on supporting their combined rebellions. Join us next episode, as this unusual triumvirate of a defamed Aksumite prince, resentful Himyarite noble, and the Shah of the Persian Empire plan an invasion to fulfill their one shared goal, bring down Mashruk. The History of Africa podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, like Aaron Lynch, Sandro, and Kevin Johnson. The show's editor and I put in about 20 hours or more of work into each episode, so your support is crucial in helping us keep the lights on. Thank you so much for helping us make the show happen.